Cloudcast Media presents from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delp and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to the Cloudcast. We're coming to you live from our massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Before we jump into our topic, we just wanted to say a quick thank you to everyone for their feedback recently as we transition to both audio and video. Thank you for the kind words, and we are down to our last few audio-only shows. So our topic for this week is AI workload sizing and basically everything GPUs. My big takeaway from this conversation was really how impactful sizing and GPU selection can be really based on a variety of variables on both the technical and the business side. So we hope you enjoyed the conversation, and we're good to jump right in right now. And we're back. And Aaron, how are you, man? It's been, uh, we've been, had a good run here of a bunch of shows together and uh, we've got another really good one today. How you been? Yeah, been good, been good. Um, you know, as we're recording this, it is for everyone here in the States and sports fans, it is the middle of uh, basketball season in March Madness. It's been a really interesting uh, couple of weeks. Yeah, no, it's been good. The weather's been good. Uh, the pollen's starting to clear up a little bit. So you and I should sound a little better than normal, which is good. And, uh, and today we're going to dive into, you know, we've, we've talked a few times on the show about how, you know, kind of the overall themes of things that we've been talking about have been shifting somewhat from, you know, kind of traditional cloud computing into obviously more AI. And, uh, you know, we're always looking for sort of overlaps. And today we get a chance to really kind of dive into what does it look like to be running one of the AI clouds, right? We now have a number of, of cloud environments that are sort of specialized in in GPUs and, and AI, uh, you know, inferencing and, and things to really help folks that are specifically focused on that and, and kind of really excited to dive into that today because it's it's really the intersection of, of where, we, where we've been, where we are today and where we're going. Yep, yep, absolutely. And whenever we're talking about, you know, clouds and, and in this instance, AI clouds, the concept of sizing and, and how do we do proper sizing for IaaS hosting, if you will, always seems to come up. And so for that and for today's topic, we'd like to welcome John Yu, CEO and co-founder at Inference AI. How are you doing, John? I am doing good. Thanks for asking, Eric. Absolutely. And welcome to the show. So let's get started with sizing. So um, I certainly, I, I talked to a lot of customers recently in my day job, and it is amazing how deep AI and ML sizing can go. It's it's far beyond just hey speeds and feeds of GPUs or GPU chips, right? And and, and so you have this idea of, for instance, training or sizing for training and sizing for fine tuning, and then sizing for at the inference stage. And those needs are very very differently. And then some folks just think, hey, pick the biggest CPU you can actually get or can afford, and just go from there because more is better. And so. I'm going to simply start there, John. How should organizations out there really think about this at an introductory level? Uh, yeah, thanks for that question. So we do see a lot of overuse of GPUs um, since the beginning of last year. And, uh, you know, it's not the fault of the CTOs of these companies. And, you know, truth be told, most CTOs before last March have not worked with this uh, GPU before in the sense that they have to use this hardware to, to train uh, to train ML. Maybe they use it for uh, gaming or whatever before. But all of a sudden, we have the AI boom, and uh, these, uh, these CTOs are now tasked with, uh, uh, with, with the task of going out there and coding in CUDA and finding out the right chips uh, to use for their, uh, for their ML jobs. And it's a very difficult task. And that's why a lot of the times we see uh, CTOs simply taking the easy way, which is to just get the latest and greatest GPU, which is the H100 on the market right now. And uh, by Q2 is going to be uh, the H200s. And uh, a lot of the times, uh, the models that they're, they're using and the workload that they're running do not need something as sophisticated and as expensive as H100. H100s are extremely expensive. Most startups uh, will have a very difficult time uh, affording something like that without significant funding. and um, Especially, uh, you know, now we have uh, you know, a lot of AI companies who are doing inferencing instead of uh, instead of training. Inferencing is a much much easier uh, workload compared with uh, uh, compared with model training, and uh, typically um, you can get by without using 
uh, the latest and greatest chip. But uh, we have seen customers time and again use H100 for their uh, for their inferencing because that's the only chip that they know, and it's costing them like eight to ten x more uh, than what is than what is required. So, um, and that's one of the the, the problems that uh, inference AI is here to help people solve is uh, we help people navigate through this. Uh, you know, nebulous uh, atmosphere that is uh, procuring uh, GPU chips. We help them understand, uh, you know, work, work, what workloads are uh, suited for what chips and how many chips are needed and how to, uh, you know, think about procurement plans um, going forward. So, yeah, to your question, um, yeah, definitely not everyone uh, needs a very complicated chip and it, it very much depends on what type of workload they're trying to run. Yeah. Before we get too deep on, before we get too deep on a lot of topics, I want to, I want to step back a little bit. You know, we have a lot of people that, that listen to the show that are familiar with kind of normal, I shouldn't say normal, but, but kind of traditional cloud economics in terms of thinking about mm-hmm. everything from like, um, you know, how do I go about purchasing and whether it's on demand or reserved instances, maybe they're thinking about like, which region do I have to put things in? Can, walk us through a little bit of the basics of like, what are the things that, um, your, your customers come to you with, you know, when the, when they, they're like interacting with a, you know, more GPU centric cloud, inferencing centric cloud. And then what do you typically have to educate them on to, to help them understand, like, th- these are the most important things that you should consider? Oh yeah. That's a, that's a really great question. That's something I've been wanting to put something out there to the broader audience. Um, and is that we're now kind of over the, the cloud era. And like Jensen Huang said uh, in, in one of his, uh, his talks, the era of general purpose computing is over. We are now inter- entering into the era of accelerated computing. And with that, it comes a lot of uh, differences uh, in terms of supply chain instead of uh, in terms of um, uh, how infrastructure as a service players are, are, uh, are playing in this field. So typically um, in the cloud era, like 2013, 2014, or even thinking back like 2017, 2018, um, when a company builds uh, builds some code, they will go to one of the hyperscalers like AWS, Azure, or, or Google Cloud, and they would just ship their code on AWS and expect everything to just work. And, and everything will be scalable and support is always ready. And there's no chance that uh, you know these guys come back to you and say, hey, we're out of chips, you can't scale. But uh, unfortunately, that is uh, that is a reality today. AWS and Azure, these guys have been out of chips for many, many months, right? Since uh, maybe like last August or or last July, and a lot of times, like we've seen customers pay up to 10x more cost for on-demand GPUs on, on GCP and AWS. So things are changing up by a lot. The hyperscalers are no longer the hyperscalers for the accelerated computing game and for the post AI era. You cannot expect to just go to your hyperscaler and have your code infinitely scalable right away. And you have to think about a lot of things regarding hardware procurement and how to scale your infrastructure as a, as a service provider. So that's why um, these days there's a lot of uh, new players out there like us, like uh, like a Core Weave, uh, where these guys were stepping in to fill the shoes of these uh, traditional hyperscalers and we're providing the accelerated compute power uh, to the end users. And uh, one of the, the paradigm shifts here in terms of, uh, of usage for accelerated computing is that people are still expecting things to just work. And they're expecting uh, you know, the cloud provider to help them with, uh, with all of their, their scalability issues. And uh, most of the, a lot of the times, uh, that is not how, how it works with, with a new breed of providers, especially we're in an era where uh, um, GPU chips are, are in a shortage and are going to continue to be in a shortage for a long time. So a lot of times you go to one vendor, uh, you assume it's going to work, you assume it's going to uh, be infinitely scalable until you actually try to scale and the vendor tells you, no, we're out of cards. And you're kind of stuck if your vendor is out of cards. <laughs> and now you have to go to a, another vendor in you know, a different region and try to set up some some new workloads in, in the other in the other region, and you have to work with cross region hypervisors and all of that you know, complicated stuff that you never ever had to do uh, in in the AWS and, and Azure cloud era. Um, but unfortunately, that is a very real problem today. And um, you know, in deploying these cards, um, there's a lot of things to think about that uh, weren't traditionally an issue for, uh, for, for the cloud era. And uh, I'll just name a few important things um, for, for GPU deployment. 
Um, the first thing that people should consider when they're buying uh, GPU cards is deployment time. So it's actually not pricing, uh, not scalability, not any of that. Uh, it's deployment time because a lot of times these days, uh, if you go to a Google Cloud, they tell you, oh, uh, our, our lead time is something like two quarters or one quarter down. Can you afford to wait for that long? You know, if you're if you're a startup uh, and you're trying to build some sort of uh, minimal viable product, uh, the first step of your minimal viable product for for these AI products is you have to get the GPUs to start training your model. You can't build anything without you know without starting to, to train your model. So if you're waiting for six months to get your hands on GPUs, what are you doing in that six months? All right, that 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 is a that is a long time to wait, and uh, these lead times are also variable just because. You know, you waited three months or six months doesn't mean at the end uh, things are going to be smooth and you're actually getting your cards. So you want to make sure that uh, the vendor you're going to uh, has proper uh, deployment time that fit with uh, with the, the 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 progress of your of your business. Um, and um, yeah, so that that's one of the things that Inference AI does very well because we have a, a very wide procurement pipeline. We could typically deploy it about a week or two. Uh, and that's uh, considered very, very good for, for this industry. Um, so, yeah, uh, first thing you, you, you need to think about is deployment timeline. And after that, uh, uh, the next important thing is deployment expertise. Uh, this is something that's not very much talked about in the news, but um, it, is, it, is, it is very important for, uh, for accelerated chips because these chips, they're not... Uh, the same breed as the CPUs, where you know a lot of people in the world knows how to work with them. It took a while for data centers to figure out how to deploy H100s without running into a lot of problems. And even today, uh, we're still on that journey. A lot of vendors have the cards at, at hand; they have the the servers, but they don't know how to they don't know how to wire it. Where as soon as they wire it, it runs into a problem, and they can't figure out how to debug the problem, and the process can go for weeks. And um, we see that happen all the time and we see, you know, sometimes a card fails from the video or the server from Supermicro fails and uh, you have to ship the server back and it takes like four to six weeks and your customer will just have to wait for, for that long. And it, it's, a, it's a terrible experience. That's, that's something that, you know, in the cloud era, people didn't have to deal with, but, uh, but it's super important uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the AI era, right? And, uh, you know, on top of these uh, uh, deployment expertise, uh, issue, you have to think about a fall safe plans. This is something that Inference AI helps customer do. And uh, it's, it's basically what happens if you're, uh, if you get a, uh, a vendor that don't know what they're doing, um, the chip breaks, it takes four weeks. What are you doing in that four weeks? Can you quickly get somebody to fill in the shoes? This is very difficult. Um, you basically have to have somebody there with, with, uh, with a server that's always ready. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, after that, you have to think about what's the right card to use, and it is not very easy to to figure that part out either. Nvidia has a large fleet um, of cards, and uh, you know, most people can't really make sense of the naming. It takes a while to to understand the the pros and cons of uh, of every card and the the ROI on the cards. Um, and you need to have a procurement plan, right? Like um, because you can't expect vendors to be infinitely scalable anymore. Uh, you need to think about, you know, in May, if we're going to run a marketing campaign, we're expecting a lot of customers to come on board. If we're hosting inferencing, we have to start procuring the chips now, right? Yeah. Because the lineup is going to take a while. It's, it's not at your fingertips. It's not ready, readily scalable on demand. So people need to think about uh, preemptively when their business is going to scale. And, you know, after all of this, uh, I think that the last thing, and it's still pretty important, uh, last thing to think about is, uh, is the pricing. You know, GPUs are usually priced per hour. Uh, they're very expensive. Um, and different vendors have different pricing. And you have to think about what that pricing entails. Does it include support and, and, all, and all of that? Um, yeah. So I forget the question already. I hope this answers. <laughs> no, that was, <laughs> that was great. I mean, I, yeah, no, you really, you, you highlighted just the kind of the awareness people have going into, uh, you know, both, you know, building AI applications, but also, you know, how to, how to best interact with your, with your cloud provider. Yeah. So John, let me ask you this then. So uh, kind of a follow on, because a lot of what you're, I really like this analogy of like, hey, the first generation are, are, are general purpose clouds, if you will. And now we're moving into more of a specialization era. 
Mm-hmm. But a lot of those trends from the early days of cloud, I think, also pull forward in, into this. And, and I'll, so I'll ask you this. Is there like what organiz- what parts of the organization are you typically talking to? And what I mean by that is the early days of cloud, we, we also because of the, hey, we had, you know, large time constraints to get equipment, in, you know, in a data center, for instance, or the, some of these other things like there's a lot of parallels to GPU limited availability. And then you had the rise of shadow IT back in the day. So are we looking at a situation where in order to go faster, a lot of organizations are almost like pulling out the credit card and doing shadow AI again? Um, well, can you define what you mean by, by shadow AI? Yeah. So basically like IT, typically IT procurement, like big IT shops, you have to go through proper procurement and it takes a long time and you got to do a proper budget. And, and then you, the early days of public cloud, it was like, Hey, I'm just going to pull out my credit card, put this on my credit card and we're just going to go. Right. Cause we can just go right now because we have availability and we can just kind of pay as we go. And so like, I'm kind of wondering, is this something that to remove that friction, and go a lot faster. Sometimes this is this is like an organization that's maybe not part of like your standard IT procurement, right? Or, you know, in a big organization, it's always have big IT departments and big procurement departments. Is it pockets kind of coming to you and saying, hey, like maybe a data scientist organization, they're like, hey, I need this stuff. I can't, my organization can't do it and I want to do it faster through you. Yeah, I mean that's happening. That's happening a lot. And uh, actually, just yesterday, we come across a customer saying they want a thousand GPUs deployed within the week. <laughs> wow. No one on earth can do that for you. <laughs> no one is sitting on one thousand idle GPUs. <laughs> it's uh, it's very much a, a big shortage situation. Uh, a lot of enterprises are, are realizing this. A lot of corporates aren't realizing this. They want things right away. And there are vendors who are selling on demand. On demand pricing is typically two to three x more than um, than the dedicated pricing. Um, so it's not a it's not a good strategy um, to to go on demand. Uh, a better strategy would be um, you know to lock in something for like a two to three years because the shorter is going to be here for a while. Uh, even if you don't want to get started right away, what you can do is lock in that supply for yourself first or get in line first because it takes it takes some time to to procure it. Um, so yeah, um, uh, regarding, uh, like these, uh, these big corporates, we've definitely started seeing a lot of, uh, bigger corporates, uh, starting to shop around before they have like a fully formed thesis on, uh, on what, what, what they're going to do, uh, with the hardware, um, is, is, is valuable resources to, to get the allocation on the hardware first. Yeah. yeah. You, you guys obviously, uh, you know, given the name of the company, uh, you know, you focus more on inferencing. Are you still able to serve customers who kind of want to do the the full life cycle? Maybe they're they're actually training their own models, maybe as opposed to you know bringing something from Hugging Face, or is it really kind of you know you're specialized and optimized for for inferencing? Um, or, or how does you know how does that typically work with customers? Is it you know is is today almost all generative AI, or are you still seeing a lot of predictive AI, or what's you know kind of what's the mix of that you're seeing from people, and then how do they typically sort of deal with that? Yeah, so we are a, a one-stop shop for both training and inferencing. Um, I know the name might be a little misleading, but uh, we we can actually we can actually do both uh, very well. And in fact, um, most uh, training and inferencing are two different phases uh, of AI and ML. So typically, you need to train the model first, and then you host it for inferencing. And today, most of the customers are still in the training stage, and that's because the AI boom hasn't taken off for a long time. Right? It really started last year around June and July. And it takes uh, startups about 18 months, typically, to find a product market fit. So it hasn't been 18 months yet. That's why uh, most of these folks are still in the training phase. And that's most the majority of our customers as well. And uh, our play with inference uh, is very interesting because uh, when it gets to, uh, typically for training, uh, people will use like the, the typical NVIDIA fleet, the H100s and the A100s and the H, uh, H200s in the, in, in the summer and then the Blackwells. Um, but for for inferencing, uh, we're expecting a, a landscape where a large variety of model-specific hardware cars are going to come out. Because inferencing is very specific. You don't need to use general-purpose GPUs like H100 and pay a high premium on that. So 
So these inferencing cards, I'm talking about things like Grok, like an analog computer, the LPU, that type of thing. So these chips are very optimized for certain types of models. And if you run them with certain types of models, uh, and it's actually uh, very much performant and very, very, uh, very, very cheap. So if you're someone that, if you're a company that, uh, you know, you already trained this type of model, um, then it doesn't make sense for you to be on a general purpose GPU. You would just get the card that's best suited for your model. And um, so what might start to happen is that once we get to inferencing, there's going to be a lot of cards on the market and it is going to be mayhem for um, customers to try to discover what cards are best suited for their, for their model. So that's sort of where uh, Inference AI <clears throat> with our chat GPU product comes in and help people navigate this landscape of, uh, you know, through benchmarking and through our proprietary knowledge, we help people <clears throat> consult on, uh, you know, what, what are the best cards that suited for your use case. So in that sense, um, yeah, we're, we're serving, uh, we're serving inference uh, when, when it gets to inference. And right now we are serving a lot of model training uh, companies. And John, I wanted to follow up because you did mention yeah. ChatGPU, and that was something I just wanted to make sure we explicitly call it out and talk about it a little bit more yeah. because this whole process, I mean, as we kind of talked about here, it can be really overwhelming. And so yeah. you recently announced the, the chatbot, ChatGPU, yeah. um, and, yeah. and it should walk everyone through exactly this, the sizing process, or are you thinking of everything? And so tell everyone a little bit about uh, ChatGPU and how it came to be, please. Yeah, so um, the model training landscape is actually a, a very confusing uh, process right now. First of all, uh, CTOs, they have to figure out what cards they need, right? And it is not very easy to figure out the cards they need. If you just go down NVIDIA's fleet and try to figure out their naming, uh, you'll notice they're not the best at naming things. <laughs> they have the, the L series and the, the A series and, and the H series. It, it's very confusing. I think, in fact... Um, uh, recently, somebody from the video team said their uh, their DGX server, the DGX, uh, uh, the the name DGX actually doesn't stand for anything. It's not an acronym. It's just <laughs> they just think it sounds cool to call it DGX. So <laughs> it's uh, they're not the best at at naming things, and it's very confusing for people to to navigate. You know what cars are, are best for what, and uh, a lot of times you need to do uh, proprietary testing. Uh, before you can figure out what cars are, are best for you. And the problem in the, in the industry right now is that no one will let you do this type of testing. Right? So, um, so what happens is that, uh, let's say your testing environment is eight GPU cards and your production is 64 cards. If you run your test load on, the, on your testing environment, it actually doesn't mean anything. There's no relationship between how it performs on eight GPUs versus how it performs on 64 GPUs. It's not like one eighth the speed. Um, that's that's not that's not how it works. It's like you have eight brains now. Now you have 64 brains. They're like separate brains. So there's no uh, there's no relationship there. So it's actually very hard to predict. But if you want to uh, if you want to run your uh, your test load on 64 GPUs uh, to predict what would happen in production with your 64 GPUs, uh, no one will let you do short-term testing um, on a, a big fleet of cards without a, uh, a very large uh, a very large budget, like yeah, some outrageous budget, maybe, um, you know, maybe Google will charge you like 30 bucks an hour or something to give you a bunch of cards uh, for you to test for a week, for you to do any sort of uh, uh, predict, predicting. Um, Oh, your workload. So people are actually very much confused. And a lot of times we ask our customers, like, how did you come to the conclusion that you want 64 GPUs? And uh, most of the time we don't hear very good answers to this. It's mostly look at, you look at your budget and, you know, we can afford this. We can afford this much for GPUs. Let's put it, let's, let's test it on this much GPUs. But it's not really based on, uh, you know, a lot of testing and, uh, you know, they did a bunch of testing on different cards and they figured out this one is the best uh, performance uh, to, to price ratio for their model and all of that. So that's sort of where, where ChatGPU comes, to, comes into place. We did a lot of uh, proprietary benchmarking and testing on our own with, uh, with major models. And sometimes we help customers with the custom models. Um, and uh, because we work with a lot of these, uh, these customers, we have a lot of uh, in-house expertise on uh, what chips are best suited for what scenario and how many chips are needed. Uh, so we basically 
train our own model and put all of this information into our product that is ChatGPU. Uh, so if you go on our website right now, uh, you can hit the ChatGPU button. Um, it will, it's going to pull up a bot. Uh, and you're going to talk to the bot about what your business does. So let's say if you're making uh, like a movie generation uh, app. So the bot is going to ask you, uh, questions like, okay, how many movies are you using to train this model? Okay, and uh, how big are, are the, each of these movies? What's the resolution of each of these movies? And um, at, at the end of your at the end of this uh, this uh, chatting process, we're gonna give you a bunch of options. So we're gonna say, oh, if you want uh, price optimized, this is how many of what cars you need. And if you want performance optimized, this is how many of what cars you need. And uh, uh, there, there's a couple of different options that, that you could play around with. Uh, and uh, it's going to help you navigate and give you a better idea of what cars uh, fit your need. And then at that point, uh, you can uh, chat with one of, our, uh, one of our guys and we can get you uh, um, a good pricing that fits your need. And we'll, we'll help you deploy everything. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious. I, you know, I'm still just trying to kind of wrap my brain around, you know, having... Uh, you know, dealt with uh, kind of the evolution of cloud and on-demand and, you know, like you said, different mm -hmm. con contracts and so forth. Uh, what are you seeing, you know, it, as much as you're willing to share, like, what mm -hmm. are you seeing from customers? Because, you know, we're still in fairly early days, although we're in, you know, what feels like gold rush kind of, you know, demand days for for AI and, and chips yeah. and so forth. But like, how do how do people kind of square up between being like, well, I kind of like to experiment. Maybe I'll, I'll, you know, I'll look into something for six months. You guys obviously have probably very, very challenging uh, things with like finite amount of resources and people wanting different things. Are you, I mean, are you seeing a lot of people who are asking you to build them sort of like custom, you know, contracts for things? Or do you see a lot of folks that come to you towards the end of a, of a contract and they're like, can I extend this, please? Please don't give them away. Like what's, what are some of the common behaviors you're seeing and, and what are the asks from people? Yeah, actually a more common behavior that we've seen is people getting on long-term dedicated contracts. And the reason is this, is this, if you try to go for six months or less, even though a lot of people want to do that, the cost is going to be almost twice as much, sometimes three X, depending on how short term you want it. And at that point, it's just become a very big cost for for customers. And um, you know, if you're if you're paying two three x, then you might as well just go for a year contract or or two year contract, and you can secure the the allocation because it's very much you know um, GPU supply is very much in a big shortage right now, and uh, it's not it's not going to get better. So it's actually beneficial to secure uh, GPUs for a long term, even if you haven't figured things out. And if you're going for short term on demand. There's not a lot of vendors that have a big fleet of uh, GPUs on demand because it's just not worth it for them to do that business. So like, if you want something, let's say you want like 500 cars for like two months, there's probably like one or two companies, if any companies that are willing to take this deal and the price is going to be extremely high. You might as well just do uh, a two-year or one-year commit at that price. So that's something that we haven't seen uh, a whole lot in the cloud era, right? No one pays AWS for a year upfront, but uh, that's actually a very common practice in in uh, in the GPU service. Yeah, uh, GPU as a service today. Yeah, no, it makes makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. So, John, one final question for you, and this is a little bit of like look into your crystal ball and give us a little bit of futures prediction, right? What, in your opinion, what does like a next generation data center specifically for AI ML, what does it look like? Will the industry like, for instance, move away from GPUs or will it re somehow reduce the dependency on, on NVIDIA or will there be another class of chips that comes to be? What, what are you seeing? Um, I think first of all, we're probably not going to move away from NVIDIA. <laughs> NVIDIA is, uh, it's going to be a very powerful player here. Um, and there's a reason why their stock prices is through the roof is because they're, they're untouched. They're untouched by any competitors out there. Um, no one has any cards close to the performance of the NVIDIA cards. Um, or are we seeing, nor are we seeing these guys, you know, close to catching up the barriers that NVIDIA is building. Um, so yeah, the future is going to be very much 
uh, NVIDIA cards, I think mostly for, for training, but for inferencing, I think what's going to happen is it's going to be a lot of different cards. And, you know, for inferencing, you don't need to, you know, necessarily use CUDA. Um, you don't need to go through a lot of the, the barriers that uh, NVIDIA has put up for itself. So uh, that's sort of optimistic in the sense that uh, the shortage is going to continue for a long time. And, uh, you know, NVIDIA chips is going to be uh, also in, in, in very big shortage. But uh, if we start getting into these, you know, model specific inferencing cars, then uh, there's a good chance that uh, these cars will be in abundance. Right, like one of the biggest bottlenecks for supply chain right now is Calwis packaging from TSMC, which is the packaging used to uh, uh, to produce these uh, Nvidia and, and AMD general purpose GPU cards. And uh, if we're getting into these, you know, inferencing cards, they don't need to necessarily be Calwis packaged. Right. In fact, uh, most of them are not Calwis packaged. So we're removing a lot of the the supply chain bottlenecks uh, once we get into these inferencing cards. So the future of uh, uh, future of uh, AI data centers. I think uh, one big change is um, that um, they're going to have to figure out a way to carry uh, a large variety of inferencing cards. And um, the other the other big change is that for training, um, NVIDIA cards are getting stronger and, and uh, more powerful, but at the cost of using more power. So we saw the release of the Blackwell recently. Uh, it is extremely power consuming to a point where most traditional data centers uh, can't just you know, pop out their H100 and put the B, B100 or B200 in. A lot of them will have to redo their racks. A lot of them will have to respace their, uh, their data centers. And that's why we see like a lot of these hyperscalers are now building new data centers that are you know, like 50K, 50 kilowatts or like 30 kilowatts. Uh, to adjust to fit um, uh, these uh, more powerful cards that are coming out from NVIDIA. So future future AI data centers uh, definitely going to look very different from the data centers today. And they have to figure out on one side how to carry uh, a lot of these inferencing cards and on the, on the other side, how to solve the power problem for training. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, a lot of good stuff. A lot of good stuff, John. Thank you so much for all of this. If uh, you know, if, if folks are listening and they're they're curious about you know getting engaged with your team or in getting engaged with uh, you know with inferencing AI, what's uh, what's the best way for you know whether they're they're asking simple questions like we did or more in depth stuff? What's the best way to engage? Uh, best way to engage is just to message us at uh, hello at inference.ai. Or uh, hop on our website, book a meeting with with us, or uh, find us on LinkedIn. Shoot us a message. Um, yeah, there's a lot of ways to to get in contact with us. We'd we'll love to chat. Good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> Aaron, you and I have been wanting to to dive into this. I think we uh, we we just sort of scratched the surface, but uh, a lot of a lot of things to think about. Um, anything else you want to wrap up before we uh, before we wrap it up today? No, I was just going to simply say I I think this was a fantastic conversation. So thank you, John, because yeah, I think there's. Uh, really so much to think about. And as we kind of said in the beginning, I mean, this goes really deep, really quick, and there's lots of different ways to think about this. And there's lots of different ways to solve the problems when it comes to AI. You know, it is, a, it's your classic scale up versus scale out theory all over again. And so I think that's a really good takeaway for everyone. Well, good. Well, with that, John, thank you so much for the time today. And uh, folks, as always, thank you all for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Thanks for uh, providing feedback in all the ways that you, uh, you know, you you rate the show and give us uh, rankings. We really appreciate that. So for Aaron and I, uh, thank you to John for his time today. And we'll, we'll wrap it up and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 